Hey everybody, welcome to a, uh, another edition of Liam's Hockey. A little delinquent this week in getting these puppies out here, but um, this will be a quicker one today. He says, knowing that it probably won't be, but no, I will try and motor this one along. I actually just wanted to get something out, and uh, especially because it's Bobby Orr's birthday. But first and foremost, of course, Liam's Hockey brought to you each and every time by Hosey and Brown Automotive, my dear friend Rod Brown. I don't have the next garage ready to go, as I typically do at the end of these, but I will next week. And my shot of whiskey is uh, is sponsored by Ad Seal Services and uh, another good friend, Mark Cullen. I will be doing that in uh, just a few minutes' time. And a third sponsor, jumping in today, Ottawa Valley Uniform. And I'll be giving them... A little bit more of a shout out in just a few minutes time he's got a, a neat t-shirt here he wants uh, to promote I want to promote it with him and I think if you grew up in the Ottawa area and you um, were no stranger to some of the more common watering holes in the last 20 30 40 years or maybe before <clears throat> you'll uh, you'll love this t-shirt and uh, and I, I'm gonna show it to you in just a few minutes First and foremost, just a couple of hot button topics I want to uh, get off my chest. The Montreal Canadiens in OT, the worst team out of the 31 currently in the NHL with uh, nine games going the extra distance and Montreal finding a way to lose every single one of them, including last night, despite the Josh Anderson breakaway and at least some puck possession temporarily early. In OT, at, uh, a couple times, they uh, were, were not able to get it done, and JT Miller scored. Probably the right result. I think Vancouver was a little bit better overall. Montreal, again, a dominant third, much like they had against Winnipeg in the game before. Uh, another game that they scraped another point out of as they continue to hold on to that last playoff spot in the abysmal north. And it, uh, <clears throat> I do believe that they'll finish uh, in the top four. I did predict them for, predict them for third. That is starting to slip away incrementally, but I still think they can get there. But they need to go on a roll of some sort and certainly at the very least make up for the fact that they're losing every single game that goes into extra time. If you think of even if they had half, four or five of those nine points, they would be comfortably in a playoff position and in fact uh, challenging right there for first with your Torontos and Edmontons and Soon to be Winnipeg's by the way it's going. So it's tight at the top, it's tight at fourth. And yet having said that, I do think the top four teams, the four that are there right now, are going to be the ones <clears throat> that will emerge. A lot of racetrack left though. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. In respect to overtime, look, you know, the mistakes that they were making under Claude Julian, for example, having Shea Weber and uh, Sherratt out there at any point, at any time, in overtime is an abject failure on the coaching staff and that hasn't happened recently <clears throat> we have seen in the last few times that Montreal has gone to extra time that they have they have they are now following the program if you will and if they if you don't see what you like as you gain the offensive zone you circle back out that's what everybody does it's all well and good to say to press on, press on. Well, <clears throat> no, you shouldn't. You should fall back, try again, make a quick pass. Hopefully you have somebody with some speed that can gain the zone. Maybe somebody can get away from a check. Maybe you spring somebody like they did last night with Josh Anderson on the breakaway. And they have, in the last few games, had some opportunities in overtime. Paul Byron, what have you. I think where a lot of angst last night post-game was having... Uh, Dano and Byron start in overtime when they have had such abysmal seasons offensively. It's all well and good to have Petrie out there, but and then the explanation after from Ducharme that he's putting them out there to try and gain puck possession and then maybe make the changes, which in effect didn't necessarily happen per se, although they ended up with puck possession. They ended up with a line change. Or two, you got other bodies out there that had the chance and everything else. So it's hard to be super, super critical of it, except it just doesn't make any sense on paper that you would start those guys in OT. 
And and I know that first face-off is so critical. There's no doubt about it. But I watch a lot of hockey, more than the average human, and I'm seeing some other teams do some other things. I want to tell you what the Boston Bruins do. If they lose the puck at any time, they are a three-person, a three-player press. They will go right after you and come hell or high water. If they give up an odd man going the other way, well, they'll hope that they can either get back or defend it or get a save. But they will pressure. Of course, now you're seeing all sorts of teams go with three forwards. And Montreal recently has tried that as well. And you're, of course, seeing teams shorten the bench dramatically. And, and I think there's been, some, there's been some mismanagement in terms of personnel on the ice. There's been some mismanagement to start overtime. I'm talking specifically about Montreal here now. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the few chances that they have had recently, like they just haven't capitalized. And I think right now, look, if you don't think these guys are sitting in the room post game, and the next time, whenever it'll be, it'll be the 10th time that they're not gripping the stick a little bit. I'm sure they are. It's human nature. I went, oh, Jesus. Well, you know, it's, it's all well and good that they're tying these games up, which has also been a little bit of a change on a positive note for the Montreal Canadiens. Going into this season, they were dead last. Another category they're dead last in. They were dead last in the last five years of team scoring to tie a game with the goalie out. And here we are in recent times, especially under Ducharme, and they're doing it. And they did it last night again. And it's uh, it's quite something to see. Of course, conversely, <laughs> you hate the fact, if you're a half fan, that they're in that position, that they got to tie it up. So, ah, uh, well, you know, it's uh, back in the day, uh, before, uh, before the shootout, you know, it'd be a tie. They'd have nine ties. Ties used to be an okay thing. I grew up with tie games. They weren't a bad thing. I mean, you can look at it the other way. Well, how many regulation losses do they have? I mean, they're hardly losing in regulation. But uh, as it stands today, in the turtle race, in the weakest division, they hold down the, the last playoff spot. And another big one tonight. And so, you got Vancouver again tonight. You get the W tonight. You've taken three out of four points against the Knights. Say, oh, it will be the same in Vancouver. If it goes to overtime tonight and say somehow or a shootout and Montreal was to manage to win, they went up with three and four. Vancouver went up with three and four. Vancouver, as much as they're pressing and charging, they're seven and three last ten, they're not really the ones. Like Habs have four games in hand and 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 they're, they're a couple points up, uh, I think three up on the Canucks. This Vancouver's charging and they've made up a lot of ground. Uh, but even just say the last... 10 games, okay? Vancouver's got 14 points in the last 10 games. Montreal's got 12. Vancouver has picked up two points on Montreal in the last 10 games. That's how tough it is to make up the ground. And especially if you're carving out points in extra time. As much as it sucks for the Hab fans and the team that they continue to lose in OT or a shootout, those points right now are critical in this turtle race, which is what it is. So... That's it for the Habs. We'll see. And uh, we'll see what happens tonight. We'll see what happens tonight. Um, been missing a call on a few things, a few games, a few predictions. That's for sure. Uh, I, I thought, uh, I still do think that Daryl Sutter's the wrong guy to come in behind Calgary's bench. Yet they've won four out of, what is it, four out of five now? Yeah, three in a row loss and then one beat Toronto last night. Pretty damn good. And they've crept to within a few of Montreal. And, and uh, Habs only have one game in hand on them. So this continues to be big-time action for the Calgary Flames. I, I think they caught a Leaf team that showed their rust from having not played for almost a week. That's what it was. They had brutal goaltending performance by Anderson. They're Anderson. And, and uh, uh, you know, they traded chances and, and Calgary came out on top. Just like Montreal coming back off a road trip. How come nobody says this? Everybody says part one of this. They say, everybody knows when you come back from a long road trip, you always suck. You always struggle. Why? Nobody ever, nobody ever says why. What? You guys just figured it out? Think about it. You're back with your families. Men are back with their wives. Guys are back with their girlfriends. Think about it. 
You're reconnecting, man. That's why you struggle the first game at home. You're back in the family way. And so you suck your first game back. I think Montreal will be better tonight. Vancouver was a better team through 40 minutes. And they shouldn't be, especially without Peterson. You kidding me? So it uh, we'll see what happens. As for Toronto, I think they'll win tonight too. But, you know, they'll uh, Campbell's playing tonight. Anderson... Has his ups and downs. Toronto's struggling a little bit right now, but who really cares, man? They're gonna make the they're gonna make the top four all day. They can put their skates on the wrong feet and still make the playoffs in the North, and uh, they'll they'll get there. And then whoever you match up with, you match up with. I really think the only team that they've got to be definitively fearful of in a best of seven would be Winnipeg, a fully healthy Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, anybody could beat anybody. But in a, in a best of seven, when you're playing them, even though we've done <laughs> a bunch of games in a row this year, I still think that um, the Leafs will be heavily favored on uh, on everybody. But I think the one team that could knock them off would be the Jets. If Carey Price stands on his head, and if Calgary can get there and Markstrom can steal a couple, you know, Calgary, everybody could be a hell in a cell, let's be honest. And so we'll just have to play that out. But I'm not as concerned about Toronto. I saw Kerfoot's comment today on social media. He said the same thing. I mean... No one wants to have only one regulation win in seven, and that's why you've got Edmonton breathing down their, their neck, but Toronto's got games in hand, and and uh, it's the same with Winnipeg coming charging up as well, and I just think the Leafs will right the ship here, and they'll continue to score a bunch, and they'll get back on the winning track, and, and maybe they just don't win the North by the eight or ten points they were leading by a couple weeks ago, but they're, they should, I think, I believe, will we'll still win it. Still think Calgary's going to fall back. I, I think it's still a bit of an outlier here, what we're seeing with Daryl. And, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll just have to continue to play it out. Again, Calgary and Toronto right back at it tonight. Montreal, Vancouver right back at it tonight. Ottawa plays again on Monday. Hey, look, you know, the Sens are who I, I think we thought they were. They, they give, in most instances, a, a fairly gritty performance. They've obviously had a lot of goaltending struggles too. I mean, there's been some... Joey Decord was a nice story, and then Matt Murray, great, terrible start, bounced back a little bit. They've had the hog in there; he's kicked some BBs out. I mean, it's it's been it's been a real challenging time and net for the Senators and through the lineup too. I mean, different times, different guys have stood up and look. They've played Montreal and Toronto very well, and they've got most of their wins against those two teams, and uh, and they've got some other W's, but at the end of the day, they're going to finish last in the North, and they'll be one of the worst teams again in the NHL. So that's a whole other story for another time. And and uh, from the other perspectives, the other teams, though I think the biggest story, one of them anyway, uh, south of the 49th, would be the fact that um, Colorado got McCarr and Byram back. I mean, those of us uh, big Canadian hockey supporters have been wondering who's coming along to replace Drew Doughty and Duncan Keith. Like, we need some new blood here. Well, guess what? It's on the blue line of the Colorado Avalanche. Like, these last two games that they've played with these guys back in, they are a whole different team. It's one thing to have McKinnon and company up front, but holy lifting with uh, McCarr and Byron back there. And and look, we've got Thomas Shabbat here in Ottawa as well, who I think is going to be a blue chipper too. Right now, all the ice he's getting it's only human nature. He's trying to do too much out there. He has great shifts, great moments, great periods. He's had some great games, but he's had far more poor outings, largely due because he's just trying to do too much. He's out there 30 minutes a game, and and he's playing. They're trying to find a, a, a decent partner for him, a complimentary partner. They haven't been able to do that yet, and they may not be able to do it for a year or two yet. But when they do, and I... I believe they will they'll improve they've got some blood coming as we all know from und and sanderson looks like he's going to be a beauty pinto should be able to step in and there'll be some changes there some 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 better play for sure but the holes that are the holes are still going to be pretty big gaping holes probably for the next 12 months too so we'll see but in terms of team canada i think you can pencil in thomas shabbat down the road as well but right now uh mccarr and byram and colorado them coming back to the lineup virtually same time massive massive change in uh in the avalanche and i think they've won something like five in a row right now you've got some teams vegas steamrolling i mean it's uh it's crazy it's just crazy and and you know you just don't know what you're going to get on any given night now we've got the bruins 
under COVID protocol. They had just won a couple in a row. It looked like they had righted their ship and just getting ready. So this is just part and parcel with whatever we're getting this year, right? So look, I want to jump in quickly here. Ottawa Valley uniform. That's my buddy Kevin Jardine. Look at this beauty here. Tavern Tour, Ottawa Hall. Now I know most of you, like me, love going into loved going into the old taverns back in the day. Look at the names on them here. Oh, <laughs> is that any good? There's 18 of them. I've been to 12. So, and I'm not a spring chicken. Some of these places have been closed a long time. I was with two guys yesterday that have been to every one of these. Dave Woolley and Donnie Miller. But uh, uh, Kevin's got those t-shirts for sale. Ottawa Valley uniform. Jumping in, taking a little sponsorship here on Liam's Hockey. Along with Rod Brown, Ahosian Brown, and Mark Culler, Cullen of, uh, of Adseal Services. And, and uh, I'm promoting that t-shirt. So I'll, I'll be throwing that up on my social media post and putting it out there. And anybody who wants one will uh, hook you up with Kevin and, and uh, be able to get you one of those great tees. I'll be, I'll be wearing it. Uh, I love it. I just love it. So... A um, couple of things here quickly before we uh, shut her down. A couple uh, birthday toasts today. One to my dear friend Crystal Mitchell and uh, one to Robert Gordon Orr. Touch on that in a second. I don't think there's too much else hockey-wise I want to say. Um, cut off the, covered off the Habs and the Leafs from the Canadian perspective. And and uh, um, I know there's afternoon games on um, right now, so... Got to get in front of the TV, heading over to the Tiki Bar at Rockets and uh, drill a couple back. It's got a TV out there, so we'll catch some action. So I think that's pretty much it. We're going to shut her down, keep her short and sweet today. Just want to talk about the Habs and OT and just mention that. I mean, they got to be smarter, man. You got to, I, I, I don't know how, how a thousand people will go on social media, 999 will say, Ducharm, what are you doing? And he has to go on post game and, and try and defend the fact that he started Byron and Dano simply because he was trying to secure possession of the puck. Uh, it's, it's, it's prevent defense. And I, I think the mindset in OT has changed where you got to go on the attack, but you got to do it to, to the extent where if you gain the zone and you don't like your attacking angle, then you come back. That's how, how you possess the puck. I mean, look around and see what the other teams that are primarily winning in extra time, what they're doing. It's a copycat league. By the way, I want to say one other thing that everybody's crying about these days, and, and to a degree, rightfully so, the power plays. This slingshot back. Look, as I shift around the bottle of whiskey, my thinking on that always been that, that, that came from Sweden. As far as I know, this came from Sweden came into the NHL 12, 11, 12 years ago. It, it was, it's a bastardized version of the torpedo, of the Swedish, Swedish torpedo, which became a style for them where they hit a trailer guy coming right up the middle. So right up the middle like you would have a torpedo, if you can envision that. And that's what they called that play, and it's been incorporated into power plays where you have a man advantage, you have the extra ice time, and if you hit a trailer coming up with speed, he's got more options. This is the way it's supposed to work. He's got more options than if you're just trying to gain the zone or if you're shooting it in, like the old days, and flooding one of the corners and regaining puck possession that way, which can still work. So can a first foray into gaining the zone. But what's gone on is it's done now so often and to a fault that you've got players who look like they're three feet from the blue line and they're passing the puck back 60 feet to a guy who's, yeah, he's flying up the middle, but holy lifted. You gain the zone already. Just weird. And, and uh, everybody's doing it. So it'll be interesting to see when that inevitably uh, morphs, morphs, morphs off. Yeah, the hand... Still, uh, it's coming along, but uh, it's good. It's not great, but it's good, but that's okay. It'll be three weeks on Tuesday. All the uh, stitches that were supposed to dissolve have dissolved. The ones that he sutured in, I've taken a couple of those out, and uh, it's coming along, but it's, uh, I only really need it for a couple things, right? Grip a golf club, make a fist, and hold a pint. So that's it. I can't pick up the whiskey bottle, so it's not that good. On that note, let's sign this puppy off here. This shot of whiskey brought to you by Ad Seal Services and Mark Cullen. 
and the whole show brought to you by Hosey and Brown Automotive. And uh, I want to congratulate and say happy birthday to my dear friend, Crystal Mitchell. And of course, a happy birthday to the greatest person who ever wore skates. Born on this day, March 20th, 1948, makes him 73 years young. Robert Gordon or Bobby Orr. And um, as most of you know, got to know Bobby a little bit over the years. Would never consider myself a good friend by any means, but I did have the opportunity to speak at his golf tournament for six years in a row. And he wrote the foreword to my second book. And all that originated from a meeting with him on the golf course in Smith Falls at the Mike Fair Chevolds Golf Classic for Juvenile Diabetes. And and that Bobby lent his name, his time, his credentials, his his efforts and everything to that tournament for over 10, 12 years. And he met Mike in Oshawa when he was playing junior in Oshawa. And you think about it, they went that far back. And Mike Fair goes on to start a life in Smith Falls, gets married, has children, has a daughter who is born with juvenile diabetes. And Mike's trying to raise funds for the family, for the, for the fight the disease, for everything else. And who jumps in? Bobby Orr, just from knowing him from all those years ago in Oshawa, and, and lent all that he could to that golf tournament. And I'm playing behind him one day in 2000, 21 years ago, this summer. And someone told him who I was. So he kept running back, and and because, uh, you know, it's a full full field. So you go to a tee block, you got to wait. Kept coming back to our group and trying to stump me in trivia questions. It was hilarious. <laughs> he finally got me in around the eighth or ninth hole or something. And then we're on the back nine, and I said, uh, Bobby, I, I got a radio show. Would you consider coming on it? And he said, uh, no, Liam, uh, I don't do those things. I don't do those things. I try and avoid them. I said, okay, I, I get it. I know you get a 1,000 requests. No problem. So we play a few more holes. We come to a par three. Big backup. And, and uh, so he's still on tee. I'm on the tee. We drive up. Everyone's in carts. He's in a Cadillac golf cart, by the way. I'm not kidding you. It's a Cadillac grill on it. It was hilarious. Anyways, he comes back to me. He's, I'll never forget it. He's got a golf visor on. It's pushed up. He's smoking a big stogie. He's got his golf shoes undone. Uh, he looked like a million bucks. Uh, he looked great. And he says, you know what, Liam? I'll tell you what. You hit the green on this par three. I'll, I'll do your radio show. <laughs> There's a big crowd. Like he said it in front of everybody that was hanging around that tee block. Now, keep in mind, he's in the group in front of me. So I got to wait. 20 minutes, right? He's got a group in front of him. Then Bobby goes. Then they wait. The group waits. Everybody on the other hole knows what's going on. They're watching. Everybody that's come up behind me is watching. And I'm on the tee. It was 184 yards. Pretty straightforward. No trouble. A couple of small bunkers. It's Smith Falls. It's a nice track. But there really, you know, there wasn't a ton of trouble. No water or anything I had to worry about. So 184 yards. I got a five iron. And like that's that's pretty much max five for me. So I thought, you know what? I went and got a four. I got a four iron and I choked up on it a little bit. And I just said, just smooth it, man. That you keep your head down, just smooth it. I got this all day. And as soon as I hit it, not only did I know it was in the air, I said, God, go in. Like I knew it was gonna be tight. I just absolutely smoothed it. And my dear friend Danny Kelly, who I was playing with screaming as the ball was in the air he's screaming to Bobby give him your number give him your number it was hilarious he ended up coming on my show and then I ended up exchanging emails with him and I asked him if he would consider writing the forward to my second book and he did and what an honor so to Bobby the greatest player ever in the history of the sport of hockey and my dear friend Crystal happy birthday to you both Everybody stay safe, be well, and uh, I'll have another garage for Hosey and Brown when we uh, fire this puppy up next week. Thanks to the sponsors. I'll have Kevin Jardine's t-shirt information for you too. Take care. G'day.